Hey, have a seat. Good morning, good morning, Makers Church. It is so good to be together and to be back in this house. How good is this? Hey, if we've never met before, my name is Derek, and I have the absolute privilege of serving here as the lead pastor. And we are so glad to be back with you in this place. And we're also so grateful for each and every one of you that's joining us online. Uh, people here in the house, can you just give a big roar for the people at home so they can hear you? Yes, yes, yes. It is uh, a new season. It is a new season. Season And one of the things that uh, we've been talking about a lot in this last year, one of the things that we've pivoted the most towards, one of the things that, that we've really taken to heart, is this idea that the church is not a building. We, we've, we haven't just talked about it, we've experienced it. We've been without a building for more than a year, and God has been faithful. We just sang about it. We have been uh, faithful as a church as well in responding to where God would lead us and what he would have us do in that time without a building. And so we've talked about that. The church is not a building. The church is a people. The church is a family. The church is the community of God. But, but I don't want to overlook the fact that families have homes and that homes are important, that homes are essential, they're vital to our well-being as families and as people. And so while we know the church is not a building and that we are a family, families have homes and we're grateful for this home. We decided, we were inspired by Pastor Shalise, I guess, uh, to do a home renovation during COVID. And so the Millers, we are in the middle of a, what started to be a, a small facelift on the kitchen to like the whole downstairs of our house. And so we've been camping basically in our backyard for the better part of a couple months. And you know, that's really cool and novel for like a week. It was a great opportunity for the kids. Like, Dad, wait, we're so thirsty. I'm like, drink out of the garden hose. Like, that's what I did when I was a kid, you know. And there's no running water downstairs, and everything's covered in dust. And our whole downstairs has moved outside, which is being rained on right now. And uh, the weather person got it wrong, wasn't even in the forecast. And uh, it's, it, it gives you a whole new appreciation for the comfort of a home when you're displaced, when you're out of it. And we feel the same way about this as a church. It, it's, it's, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it is a great thing to be gathered together back again in this place. And I, the last time I actually stood on this stage and preached to a live audience, if you were here for that, we were actually winding down um, a capital campaign to renovate this house. And uh, so much has changed since then. If, if you were with us then, you know that we kind of put a, a stop on that capital campaign. Um, and we, we redirected any extra giving towards our benevolence fund to help people out through this really tough time of COVID. And you were all faithful. And God did so many things through that. And what has happened since then with this place is more exciting than I can even talk about. And I'm not going to talk about it this morning because we're in the preliminary stages of understanding an entirely new possibility as a church. And so you'll hear about that in the weeks and months to come. But we can just clap that up for God's faithfulness and his timing and what that means for us. Uh, today we are starting a brand new, not only a brand new series, but really a trilogy. Yeah, you heard it you heard it here, a trilogy of series, three series that will take us through the next couple months that are deeply interconnected, and they're actually going to help us walk through one passage of Scripture for the next three months, one passage of Scripture for the next three months. It's this passage, Acts 1-8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And that's what we're going to be journeying together through for the next couple months. But don't worry, it's going to help us make the most sense of what does it mean for us to be the church. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the mission of the church. And that was really about the what. What is the church here for? What are we here to do? And over the next few months, we're going to really be answering the question of where. Where should we as the church be the church? 
Jesus lays it out for us. You should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And what we're going to do is try our best to understand what are our Jerusalem, our Judea, Samaria, our ends of the earth. What does that mean for us? Where are we supposed to go with this witness that we've been entrusted with? And so this first series is titled Home is Where the Fill-in-the-Blank is. And yeah, that's the name of the series. Home is Where the Fill-in-the-Blank is. And we're really going to be focused this month on understanding our Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem. What is our Jerusalem? And, and, and really, that's what, what this is. It's, a, it's, it's us trying to make sense of what is home. When Jesus gave those words and he said, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth, we really think he meant, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Like, Jerusalem meant Jerusalem. It meant the city. That was the starting, that was the sending place that they were starting from. But it also meant home. It meant the place you're from. So, yeah, we do think Jerusalem was intended, but it also meant start with where you are. In fact, in the, in the Catholic Church, uh, they, they refer to this concept as the domestic church back all the way into the first century, uh, the Greek used the word um, ecclesiola. So ecclesi, the, the ecclesial thing in the small form, the ecclesiola, the small church, the, the tiny church. And our homes are meant to be little churches. If you are in Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, we want to talk for the next month about what happens in our homes, in our household. How do we start there. But it also means the little church, the local church. It means this family. So it's about our biology, our our biological family. It's also about our spiritual family. They, They say that you don't get to choose your family, but you do get to choose your friends, right? But we 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 don't believe you get to choose your friends in this small church, in this in this family church. When you look around Yeah, you get to choose whether or not you come. But once you make that choice, we receive everyone that God brings to us as a spiritual brother and sister, as as a blood family member, because we are connected by the blood of Jesus. And so as we march this out over the next few weeks, I want you to be thinking about your home home, whether it's being renovated or not, you're living in the backyard, and this home, this spiritual family that you have been entrusted with. Ephesians 2 says this, verse 19, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So the the scriptures say that when you say yes to Jesus, you don't just become connected to him, but we become connected with each other, that we become members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. One of my favorite sayings is God doesn't reside in temples built by human hands. He doesn't live in this building but he resides in human hearts. And when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us. And when we show up together in places like this, we become a temple, the body of believers, a temple that his spirit dwells in. And what we really want to dive into over the next few weeks is this idea that our homes, we have such fond memories of our homes, whether it's our home home or or our church homes, we have such fond memories. We have pictures. We just kind of got rid of a bunch of stuff as we're doing this renovation. We went through a bunch of old pictures, so many good memories. But we also have so many hurts, so much pain, so much trauma, so much baggage that comes from our own home households and from these church households that we may have experienced in the past. We want to step into some of that stuff in the next few weeks. We want to talk about these family dynamics, and, and really begin to understand how we can best love God and love others in reaction to, in response to, in reality of the beautiful and the broken, the good and the bad. 
How do we navigate our way through that? And so that's what we're going to be spending our time on. That's kind of the lay of the land. That's our first kind of chunk this month. Home is where the fill in the blank is. We're going to start filling in those blanks in the weeks to come. But today I want to really focus our, our attention on one word and get some understanding around what Jesus tells us to do in all of those places, which is to witness. Can I get a witness? Come on. This is, what, this is what we're going to talk about for the rest of this morning. Because Jesus gives us this mandate as his family, as his body, as members of his household, to go be a witness in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so I want us to leave this morning understanding what does it mean to bear witness, to witness. Now, I, I saw it happen when I said that word. I saw, many of you kind of squirmed in your seat. Uh, I saw some of you at home watching online kind of uh, get flush in the face. Because this word, this, this word witness, or maybe we can use the word evangelism, or maybe we can even use the word testimony or testimony. Those words, they can make us uncomfortable. Why? 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 It's not just because you don't like speaking. Everyone says, oh, I don't, I don't want to testify. I don't want to bear witness because I don't like to public speak. That, that's not the issue. It may be a little tiny, thin slice of really what's going on. But I think the reason that word can make us feel so uncomfortable is because we've had such a negative experience with it, whether we've been the one doing it or the one receiving it. For, for some reason, when we think about the word evangelize or witness or, or to testify, for some reason, if you're like me, the word like opposition comes to mind. The word like stand against comes to mind. And you could think about like a street corner prophet with a bullhorn and a soapbox. You could think about uh, the people with signs that say you're going to hell. You, you can think about these, these negative connotations and experiences that you may have seen or experienced, or for some of you, even participated in. And it can be so confusing and kind of cause such a mess because, well, when you really begin to understand the heart of Jesus, that is so contrary to what he's asked us to do. Others of you are comfortable because, well, maybe you've, you've been coerced or co-opted in your spiritual household in your church past to go do some weird, strange things, to go, like, argue with a stranger, or to go passively pass something out and walk away, to confront someone that you don't even know, and that, that left you with a, a bad taste in your mouth, and <clears throat> you just don't really want to do that. Maybe you're here this morning or you're watching online and you were on the other end of that. You were the person being proselytized to. You're just walking down the beach and somebody hits you up, starts confronting you about some things you didn't ask to be confronted on. And the only message you got is that you're a sinner, that you're going to hell. And for some reason, you, you can begin to paint the picture that God is against all sorts of things instead of being for you. And so there's all these valid reasons to be uncomfortable when the pastor stands on a stage and says, we're going to talk about what it means for you to witness, to, to share, to, to testify to the good news, to be witnesses in these places. And if you're like me, I hear those, I'm like, I'm nowhere near Jerusalem, I'm good. I don't even know where Judea and Samaria are, I'm good. The ends of the earth, don't know what that means, so I'm exempt. You can read yourself out of this text so easily. Witness, nope, I don't like public speaking. Where? Nope, don't know where those places are, never been. Flights are shut down, COVID's a real thing, I'm out. And then you could go, yeah, yeah, that's just not for me. And unfortunately, we, we, we're so cautious with this thing because Christians, 
because of a misunderstanding of this, have become known so much more for what they're against than what they're for. And we think that that God is against people instead of having come for people. But there's another reason that I think we struggle with bearing witness. In fact, I think this might be perhaps the most detrimental reasons we don't profess our faith, the reason we don't share what God is doing. The reason that some of us don't talk much about our faith is because we don't have much to talk about. Our silence is actually the loudest thing about what isn't happening in our lives. I think so many times we don't share about what God is doing because we have moved ourselves out of the activity of God. We have stepped away from allowing God to do what God is doing inside of us. And we may have moved into a space or a place where God is moving all around us. Sometimes we, we just want God through osmosis. We just want to in, enter into places where we know God is doing something, where God is moving. We, we want to be in the vicinity of God. Maybe that's even what brought you to a place like this or caused you to tune in. Is like you've got a hunger for God. You want God to do something. But God, the fire of God is dangerous. And the closer you get to the fire, the hotter it gets. And so you just kind of assume that God is safe like a campfire. Like I can just get close enough to the activity of God. And so you might come into places like this where God's moving around you, but you have not invited him to move inside of you. you you've been okay with God moving in the margins, but instead what you need to do is invite God to move into the epicenter of your soul. Because when that happens, it leaks out of you. You can't even contain it. We, we, we have to move from being close to God by association and really inviting God into the center of us and allowing him to make us a new creation, to allow the transformative power of God to shift and change us in such a way. And when that happens, it comes out of you. Listen to what the prophet Jeremiah says in, in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, he says, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. When, when was the last time? We invited God to do such a deep work in us that we have no choice to keep it in. When was the last time you allowed God to move inside of you in such a way that it caused burning in your bones? And the only way to relieve that burning is to tell somebody about it, to, to profess it, to proclaim it. I, I'm guilty of this all the time. God, and I have so many excuses, so many narratives in my own head. I pastor a church. God's doing something out there in them. And so many times I, I neglect, I overlook, sometimes I even refuse to allow God to come in and do a deep work inside of me. Because when he does, you cannot help but talk about it. You cannot help but share about it. We don't have to look too far for examples of this. We do this all the time in life. Like I'm a dripping 
Apple ad campaign. I got the watch. I got the phone. I got the iPad. I got the computers. I, I, don't need, I did not approve that Dell monitor in the back, Mark, that's supposed to have an Apple on it. If, literally, if you're on our church staff, you're excommunicated from the, the staff thread if you don't have an Apple phone. You don't even get the messages because you, you make it turn green, and we don't like that. Sorry, non-Apple maker staff team. I did text you on the side last night. That never happens. But, like, we do this. We become evangelists for things that are really fun or exciting or things we care about. So sometimes it's for, like, a great restaurant, or sometimes it's your sports team. Uh, TV shows. Somebody told us about Ted Lasso. I was like, yeah, just TV. We're not, t- we're not TV show people, my wife and I. We don't really watch TV shows, but we went on a vacation. We were recommended Ted Lasso. We binge watched the whole thing, and I'll tell everybody about it. It's vulgar. It's, it's not, like, super pure. Don't watch it with your kids. But the message is so good. Ted Lasso, you need Apple TV, which, by the way, it's an Apple, Apple product. I'm faithful. And then we can get really excited about really stupid things, like recessed lighting. We, we put recessed lighting in our kitchen remodel, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. We've been living in darkness this whole time. I mean, I'll even make it like a spiritual metaphor for something as stupid as LED recessed lighting. I'm an evangelist for it. I walk into people's houses, and I'm like, you don't have recessed lighting in here? Like, we can get really excited about things. We're so apt to share about it. But when it comes to talking about what God is doing in our own lives, for whatever reason, we just zip it. We don't talk about it. And I know, I I know, there's many more. I've already addressed multiple excuses as to why we don't. But there's even more. Many times we don't talk about God or, or, or testify or witness because, well, we just simply don't feel educated enough. We're like, I don't know the, I don't know the Bible well enough, so I'm going to go learn that. And once I know everything about the Bible, then I'll go tell some people about it. You feel ill-equipped or ill-informed. And people can make you feel with their, their language, like, inadequate. You can listen to a sermon or someone share a devotional, and you're like, I can't do that. So I'm not going to do that. What I want you to know this morning is there's a, a difference between teaching or preaching and witnessing. There's no magic to bearing witness to what God is doing in your life. I know we say, oh, that, 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 that's like reserved for pastors or to like go spread the gospel. That's like a missionary thing. I'm not called to that. I'm not qualified for that. If you're thinking that, you're wrong. If you're thinking that, you're wrong. And here's, here's why. Because, yes, you can choose to follow Jesus or not. God has given us that free will choice. But if you choose to follow Jesus, you cannot choose whether or not you want to be a missionary. You cannot choose whether or not you should bear witness. Because Jesus says it like this in John 15, 16. He says, you did not choose me. He said, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give it to you. It's spontaneous. The moment you say yes to Jesus is the moment he sends you. The moment you say yes to Jesus is the moment that he makes you a missionary. We need to rethink what it means to be a missionary. A missionary is simply a person living on mission. We talked about that last week. Who is that mission for? If you're a follower of Jesus, it's for you. How do we do that? We bear witness. We bear witness. I was a eighth grade kid in the nineties. You can picture me because that's cool again. Like middle part, you know, Gen Z is like, oh, let's make nineties cool. It's awful. But you can picture this kid, like long surfer hair parted down the middle, acne punk, skater kid, 
knew everything. And one day I, I walk into my brother's room, and you can picture his room. Pearl Jam posters, um, guitar in the corner. We were all in grunge bands back then. My brother's room was a mess. And I walk into my brother's room, and he's reading this book, which I've never known my brother to read a book. And I go, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm, I'm reading the Bible. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, I'm reading the Bible. And I'm like, why? Why? And he closes it. He goes, I don't know. I don't understand this thing. But remember that girl, Chantel? I go, yeah. He's like, well, she goes to this church, so I followed her to church. And I don't know how to explain what happened, but I met Jesus. I know that sounds weird, but I'm, I go, what happened? He's like, I don't know. I just am different. I go, well, you look the same. I know, but I just feel different. Well, what do you mean? I don't understand. What do you mean you feel different? I just feel light. I'm like, light from what? He's like, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm like, well, I want some of that thing that you don't know, that you can't explain, that doesn't make any sense to you. What do I get some of that? And he's like, come with me. So I go to church with him, walk into a nothing to write home about little tiny church in the middle of nowhere, California, and I meet Jesus. And he changes me in a way that I can't explain. But I have the words to say something's different, and I don't know what it is. I have this Bible. I don't know what to do with it. They even tried to make it look cool. It was like the youth Bible. It was colorful. It had some pictures in there and some stuff in the sides. I didn't know what to do with it. But Jesus changed my life. And so I told other people about it. I didn't have to articulate well what changed or what happened. My, my brother changed my life because he was willing to tell me what happened in his. And it was that simple. No eloquent words, no PowerPoint presentation, no deep theological training or understanding. And, and you'll see this when you look through the scriptures. This is how it happens. The first step after Jesus grabs a hold of your life. In fact, it's so essential, it's so important that Jesus kind of bakes it into the whole process of coming to know him. He says this in Romans 10 verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from that life that was erased when you said yes to him and now you feel light. That Those things you can't even articulate, you don't know. The things that were keeping you captive and trapped, separated and distant from the source of life itself, that life, that's what you're saved from in that moment. For it is with your heart that you believe in and justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It is so essential that he bakes it into the process of saying yes to him. It's the first step. When I was that young punk kid, and I became on fire for Jesus, and I'm talking like on fire for Jesus and fully duped into like the Christian subculture. <laughs> I had the Jesus freak dog tags and all the, it was a thing back then. It was terrible. I hope that doesn't come back. But I said yes to that, and I was all on fire, and I, I opened my first MySpace page. And on my MySpace page, I put this quote that I loved so much. I believe it's from St. Francis of Assisi, but he gets all kinds of credit for stuff he didn't say, so I don't know if he actually said it. But this, this quote, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. 
Oh, I loved it. There's another excuse not to share my faith. I'm going to just live it. I'm going to just march it out. And don't get me wrong, I still love that quote, and I love the heart behind it. But it falls short. Why? Because the gospel isn't a habit. The gospel is history. It's something that actually happened in history. The gospel is good news. And news is announced. News is verbally shared. Now, not always well, because news anchors aren't the best at telling the truth, but the gospel itself is good news. It must be professed. It must be proclaimed. It must be talked about. Yes, should your life, should your actions, should your habits match the news? Yes, our lives should become transformed and changed. We should live differently because of this good news, this good news that God made a way for us to be reunited with him when we chose to choose against him because of our own sin. That he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect and sinless life, die on our behalf, take on our pain and punishment, rise again from the dead, erasing death itself so that we could have life abundantly. That's the good news. And that's the good news that changes us. It changes us at our core. And yes, we should preach the gospel with our actions. But we cannot eliminate the words. You cannot. Why? Because if we just go and live the gospel and don't tell people about it, who gets the credit? Oh, man, that guy's amazing. That, that girl, she just lives this really compelling life. You get the credit for that if you don't share, if you don't bear witness, if you don't testify as to the God who transformed you to become that type of person. To bear witness. It's actually a, it's a legal term. We've seen a lot about it in the news recently. What a witness does is they come and they, they sit under oath in front of a jury. And they tell the truth. There's two different kinds of witnesses. There's witnesses, they know something about what happened. There's eyewitnesses, they actually saw what happened. And then there's expert witnesses. They're like an expert in a field. And they can come in and they can testify. And I think so many times we remove ourselves from that seat because we go, I'm not the expert witness. God's not calling us to be an expert witness. He's calling us to bear witness, to tell the truth about what God has done in your life. There's nobody more qualified than you. It's not about getting it all right or being all rose-colored. We can be real in the witness. You go through seasons of doubt, you can be real about that. Go through seasons, seasons of disbelief. That's why we have a family that we can be honest and transparent with. That's why it starts here in this home. You go through a season where you're deconstructing and breaking things down and you aren't quite sure about this thing that you used to think. This is the place to do that. We tell the truth about what God is doing in our lives to the best of your ability. Without poetic words, we're not Gil Sotu. We can't put everything into a poem. But we can be honest with what God is doing in our own lives. It's not being right. It's not about winning an argument. It's not about persuading somebody to believe something differently than you. It's just about being true. True to your story, to your experience. I love that Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Did, did you hear that? 
It's the power of God. Not your eloquent words, not your ability to persuade or convince. God does the changing. He's just asked us to tell others about it when he's changed us, when he's changing us, when he's helping us rethink some things, learn some things, grow in some areas. We don't just tell it once after we've said yes to Jesus. We continue to bear witness to what God is doing. We aren't responsible for convincing anyone of anything. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. God does the saving. God does the transforming. He's just invited us to do the sharing. I'm going to end with this. Romans 10, verse 14. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard of him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Look at your feet. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. You are sent. You are sent. You are sent. And the last excuse I want to erase. But I don't feel powerful enough or equipped enough. I don't know what to do. Remember where we started. Acts 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It is not by your power or your might, but by His that you will be enabled and become capable and sent. And that is my prayer this morning. Would you pray with me? God, you've asked us to do this thing in these specific places. to tell the truth, to testify, to bear witness to what it is that you're doing in our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to invade us. We start there. We invite you to invade us, to permeate the center of our being that you would do a work in us that is undeniable and inexcusable. And God, that when you do that, that that would be burning in our bones that we cannot shut up. God, that you would move us to share it. That you would move us to testify, to bear witness to what it is that you are doing in us. We need you to move, God. We invite you to move. If you're, if you're here this morning or you're watching online and that's your prayer, I just want you to open your hands up and receive. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. And move in me. Maybe your prayer this morning is, God, I'm tired of watching you move all around me. And God, I want you to move inside of me. If that's you, pray that prayer. And maybe you're here this morning or you're watching online and you've never followed Jesus with your life. You don't quite understand it. You don't know how to make sense of it, but you feel this pull. Just respond to that. Say, Jesus, I need you. Today I choose to follow you. Forgive me empower me, and send me. And when you do that, the scriptures say, it's you are now sent. God, would you help all of us to see us as sent? 
God, we're going to make some sense as to where in the next few weeks, God, where are you sending us to? We're going to, we're going to unpack that. But today, would you just help us believe, help us leave here knowing you've sent me. How blessed and how beautiful are the feet of those who share good news. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.